Chapter 9. The Reed of Eagles. Althane awoke with a start, the sun casting its rays like darts into his burning eyes. Someone was clambering up the stairs of the tower, and he raised his boot in preparation to kick. Suddenly, the distraught face of Lone Gillen appeared from over the edge where the ladder climbed into the tower's nest, and he relaxed, collapsing to sprawl over the hard floorboards again. Othane, she cried, exasperated. He started into a sitting position at the urgency in her voice. The village has decided to take up the hinge pilgrimage, she said, clambering up into the nest and sitting down beside him. Her face was drawn with a sadness that made her look much older and, in a frightening way, much more beautiful to Arthane than she had ever been before. Perhaps it was because he felt sad as well. He felt it somewhere in a part of his soul that would now be empty evermore. Here atop a tower, built by hands now laid to rest, sat two weathered river people, sad that the world in which so much of their hope had lain now lay waste. Pilgrimage to the Henge, he asked hoarsely, and cleared his throat. She nodded. That used to happen only every hundred years, said he. She stroked over the floorboards with her grey fingers, following the grooves in the bleached wood. Othane put his hand on her shoulder, and she looked up at him with a raised brow. He nodded at her. She smiled and nodded back. Then she went back to swiping at the floorboards. When he drew back his own hand, a bitterness suddenly shook his whole body, and he said, Ugh. She looked up at him again, her face waxing with concern. I must go and put together our tent now, he explained. I have the sense that I must not mention him. But he is gone, and I don't want it to be so. Now she squeezed his shoulder sympathetically. I will help you with your tent if you help me with mine, hingeman. That sounds good, said he. Upon reaching the bottom of the tower, however, he suddenly said, Now that I think on it again, Loingolin, I want to do this alone. I shall join you when I have done with it. She nodded an understanding smile at him, and they headed off on their separate ways. When he reached the tent, a sense that all the world was slowly tilting to one side made Othane feel somewhat unsteady. The light of the sun seemed to dim and yellow from its prior golden red, and he felt a chill as fire crawl over his skin, leaving him feeling unwashed. He noticed then that, indeed, he was unwashed. Your sleep clings to me, father. It may be more peaceful than my waking, said Othane to his spirit. Then he ducked into the mouth of the tent. He went through his father's belongings, slowly, remembering as best he could how the clothes had hung on the carpenter's form during a time in which he had been sounder of body, thinking back to the way he had once smoked his pipe, and how he had played the lyre which was now in Othane's possession. He looked at the polished wood of that instrument, but all desire to play it had fled him. The hinge man sighed, then he began to, methodically and orderly as he could, pack everything into wooden chests that he remembered his father making after their fifth migration between camps. Their old chests had fallen into the bog in which they had lost their camel. Now they, now Othane, owned only his father's step horse. He had never had a horse of his own, for it was not the way of the shepherds to ride. They were called to wander the lands by foot. It made Othane think of Nimeth the Arm again, who was a man more devoted to the law of the shepherds than any other Othane knew. Trust not in the legs of horses, as long as ye have legs of your own, he was wont to say. For a moment Kaaba the Wanderer also returned to Arthane in memory. Then Arthane looked down at his own hands, as though the blood of the slaves he had slain still clung to them. There was much about him that marked him as anything but a shepherd. A shepherd was meant never to take a weapon, to hand in combat. He had leapt into the fray like a wolf suddenly revealing himself to be a brutal killer, no peaceful scholar of his people's songs. The dead face of the bandit, the shaft of the spear rising from his open mouth, resurfaced in the quiet horror of his mind. And all at once Othane felt like he had died a long time ago, and a stranger now wandered the waking world in his body. He felt as though he were inhabited by a foreign spirit. Othane? He was suddenly startled back into the present, the walrus head of the chieftain peered through the flap of the tent. The face waxed from hesitant concern to a kindly smile. Come in, uncle. I am just gathering our... My 
things, said the henchman. Take what time you have, Othane. The enemy is sure to come for us here. We must find safe haven, said the chief, entering and patting his successor on the back. I am truly sorry for what you have lost, Othane. Othane's lips smiled, but he did not look up. The river flows on. The river flows on, repeated the chieftain, nodding. I will leave you to it then. And he went as he had come. And so Thanum, which had had the desire to be permanently settled along the banks of ever-flowing Wythormion, began to roll up its tents that had so long stood on the soil of that place. Chest after chest was filled and loaded into wagons, some of which had now grown green with moss and uselessness. The camels were once more loaded with the treasures of their masters, the horses readied for a long and weary road. The herdsmen began rounding up their goats and cattle with familiar cries, sending their dogs out to keep the order among the livestock. Autumn was drawing into the land as well, with chill westerly winds drumming over the wall every so often, and so the children had to be dressed warmly to ward off the cold. What crops had been quietly cultivated about the tents of the folk more green-fingered were now harvested, whether ripe for the scythe or not. Dried meats and meats hung in temporary smokehouses were prepared for the journey ahead, and whatever could still be baked amidst the upheaval was baked. And so at about the fifth hour afternoon, the village had been packed onto wheels, as it had often been in the days of old. If one were to have paid close attention, one might have seen the chief sit wild, despondent atop a boulder not far from his village, speaking to a spirit with the words, What have we done, dear Malthar? Were we so blind by the lights that our brother brought with him from the south? Were you right to leave our gathering? Now we are pressed into the mill of our fathers, to be weathered by wandering for the rest of our days, despite our brave resistance. The village began to roll out of the valley in which they had so long been settled. There was no way upriver along the bank, and the sun was moving into the south, leaving the world to winter in the north. Thus they would have to wend out into the east, and then make their way across open plains northward, toward the safety of the Henge. They rolled out of the valley, wagoning into a broad land, undulating with emptiness to unconcerned eyes, not much more than the copses of aspen and the outcrops of rock amid the odd and jagged plateau crossed their way today. In the middle of the procession on long open wagons, the injured from the prior night's battle were born, ever attended by the diligent Mithalmonan. Wingelin sat there, Fognuan kneeling quietly beside her. Wingelin's mother and the mother of Huthram were also there, chattering nervously as the day gave and the sun fell westward into Rubine's sleep. Huthram was also still asleep. He had not awoken since the day of his injuries. He had barely moved, never muttered. And then an eagle swooped down, casting up the dust with its mighty wings, landing on the gloved hand of its bearer. It was the eagle of the scout second in command, the father of Yaraur, who had sent it to gather tide of the lands ahead. In its screeching language he conversed with the bird a moment. Then he rode to the fore, where the chieftain was riding, his own step horse. My chieftain, said the scout, calling forth the walrus man from his moody reverie. The chieftain saw the stern glance of his scout and the anxious eagle in this proud man's arm, and said, Tell me. The enemy moves on us. They have four hundred horsed archers at least. Each of them seems to be outfitted in some black metal, so that our attacks will glance from their armor easily. The chieftain paled. How did they know that we move? he asked. They sent ravens to watch us, chieftain. They have the tongue of the birds in their mouths. What are we to do? The chieftain muttered, more to his spirit than to the scout that rode behind him. Become the river, said the rider without hesitation, despite the fact that he had not been asked. The chieftain looked up into his eyes. Both aspects were hard as flint then. Both knew from personal scars what this would mean. Gather the willing, said the chieftain, with so much command in his voice that it made the scout attending sit up straighter in his saddle when he nodded his assent. As you wish, my chieftain, said he, and rode in among those that looked fight-worthy. Within the half-hour, a fine company of men with the will and wherewithal to be dangerous to their enemy departed from the village, headed by their chieftain. The rest of the village was sent with its twelve elders toward Glimwith. For this they would have to turn back and forward with Ormion to the south, and 
before crossing into the country that grew steadily more forested and more sheer in the west. The pilgrimage to the Henge would not be possible, with the enemy blocking their path in the north. But who knew what dangers lurked beneath the eaves of Darkhold? As the warband of Thanum thundered northward with the ardour of vengeance, Othane found himself riding shoulder to shoulder with Carbeth. The hunter looked across at his hengeman friend painfully, as though trying to apologise with his eyes. You have a hairball, methinks, said Arthane without expression. At once, Carbeth's mien broke into a sad grin. I'm sorry, Arthane, said he, and now his smile faded. Tears came to his eyes, though Arthane could see that Carbeth hated himself for it. I cursed you and your father in the shadow of his greatest work, before it was even cold. I was set upon by my demons, and now I shall never be able to tell him how I did revere him, despite our differences. Forgive me, brother. Let us say, brother, said Othane, for us the waters of Worthomion are thicker than blood. You still live. Don't leave me as my father did. Not just yet. At this Carbeth laughed aloud, or cried, it was not certain, with relief. Today we become the river, and the river flows on through all ages. We become the river, Othane repeated, kindled. We become the river, chanted the whole of the host of a sudden. We become the river, we become the river, we become the river. And then they rounded the bend of a slightly taller hill and found themselves charging a teeming army of black upon black, metal on horseback, bearing bows. Their enemy was visible, yet distant, and the suddenness of their appearance caused the entire war band of Thanum to come to a clumsy halt under a rumoured wind of fear. Some of the horses neighed, rearing, and some of the riders shouted, but then their chieftain cried a command, and they came steadily to stand at his attention once more. There in the dying of the light, the chief looked each of those they gathered before him in the eye. They were some thirty men astride all manner of step horse, bearing bows for hunting, and knives for skinning. Some bore other metal instruments, and a few even bore weapons they had salvaged from their assailants on the night of the raid. Then the chieftain nodded proudly. Even he now had a tear in his eye. My brothers, he began. He was quiet then for a long time, taking a while simply to look at them again. He seemed not even to be looking for words. Once he nodded to himself, as though he were now confirmed in some quiet deliberation. Then a newfound certainty flowed from him over his people. Today, he said at last, we become the river. And he raised the spear of his father's high. We become the river, his warband repeated, though his certainty was still somewhat weak within them. Behind their leader they were being charged by folk the like of which they had never dreamed up in their worst nightmares. Their hour could be seen to beat again, as did many others, with the pendants of fear, remembering the dark night in which he had first seen these frightful foes. We are each a droplet, said the chieftain of a sudden, and he had their attention again, for he had said it without the slightest fear in his voice. Now they all looked to his smiling eyes as he rode from one end of their company, then turned his mount to ride back to the other end again. All the while he smiled like a man at peace. Alone, he continued. A drop falls into the sand, and where the sun does not lap it up at once, the dust shreds it and divides it among itself. There is far more dust here than there are droplets, brothers. And the grasses also want their share. Shall we scatter like a brief pretense of drizzle? Some amid the war band were shaking their heads. Some whispered the word, no. Some smiled back at their chieftain with growing resolve. Bring one droplet together with another, said he. Then add another. And another. And another. And, he turned his horse to face the enemy. Another. And another, the war band began to chant. And another. Today water is thicker than blood indeed, brother, Carbeth chuckled beside Arthane as the chant continued to wax in its intensity. Soon they were all shouting it, as though their war cry were more effective a shield than the darts that their foes might loose against them could pierce. And another, become the river, and another, become the river. The shout suddenly changed, and the chieftain spurred on his horse, leading his warband to glory, whatever their forgettable end might be. The thunder of their little band in the face of that deep, dun cloud that gathered at the backs of their enemies would have been laughable, were it not for the shout that even almost the wind seemed to join them in. And another, become the river, 
and another become the river, and another become the river. The two unlikely forces were two hundred yards apart when a wind like a storm cloud suddenly spiralled in from the heavens above. The war band of Thanum came steadily to a halt again, at the command of their chieftain. Here is the answer of our shepherds, my friends, he cried. This is not the work of the shepherds, Othane said to Carbeth, and the other looked from him back to the falling pillar of black cloud with a concerned grimace. Within the whirling of the stormy limb that had suddenly gathered from a prior clear heaven, white fire now fell into the ranks of their enemy, scattering them like a wild ocean of beasts. A great tumult and uproar came from that army of warlords. All the while more fire fell from heaven, making ash of the assailants of the river people. A fire caught brand in the grasses of that place. Some odd trees that had grown on boulders and in the sheltered bends of the plain were cleft down as well. The lightning took on more and more the quality of a bloodlusty axe, which clove away anything that dared stand or draw too near. The cloud bent as though blown by the wind over the seething remains of the army then, and the fire continued to fall there. Chaos continued to drive the dark-clad forces to destroy one another in sheer horror and panic. Finally a terrible roar, some command, went out from amidst the writhing black sea of horse and man. There was a partial response amongst those mounted archers. Another roar, and then the enemy regathered itself, despite the death that loomed above, returning to some formation as best as they could. Not slowly, the storm suddenly began to clear. The heavy winds that had been swept up now swept away the stormy wonder that had brought them forth, and even stars appeared above in the evening sky. All there saw a man then, where the cloudy pillar had touched the grassy plain. He was cloaked in dark leather, his hood cast back by the gale, and he bore an ebon staff in his right hand. Beyond the man who seemed so small before that quickly rearranging army, another figure suddenly grasped the dreadful attention of the onlookers. Tall as two men, he arose from the midst of his black-armoured warlords. There he had been drawn in a dark carriage. Now he climbed into a vast chariot, driven by two large war horses. His servants parted as he descended through their ranks, and came to a halt before the ebon man with the ebon staff. With stumping hooves and shaking manes, the war horses snorted threats before their master. There stood the great and terrible Ibex upon his dread chariot.